The Northwestern Hawaiian Islands is a vast area, rich in marine life, which has held a special importance to Hawaii fishermen and their communities since pre-contact with European explorers. These 10 predominantly uninhabited, undeveloped islands and atolls span more than 1,000 miles of the North Pacific Ocean. They are located in the middle of the Hawaiian Islands, Emperor Seamount Chain, the oldest and largest existing island chain in the world. At the southernmost part of the northwestern chain, about 130 miles from the nearest island of the populated main Hawaiian Islands, stands Nihoa. Here are many house sites and terraces, the remains of Polynesians who inhabited the small rocky island around AD 1000. According to oral history, Nihoa was used as a place of temporary residence for fishing expeditions until the late 1800s. About 180 miles north of Nihoa is Neker, or Mokumanamana, a rocky island where the original Polynesian settlers constructed numerous shrines known as Heiau. The island continues to be of outstanding spiritual importance to native Hawaiians today. North of Necker is French Frigate Shoals, the rocky Gardner Pinnacles, and six low coral islands and atolls. 18th century Western logbooks say native Hawaiians canoed north of the main Hawaiian islands to Mokupa Papa, which means low reef island, to gather birds and turtles. During the 19th century and much of the 20th century, American and foreign sailing ships exploited the northwestern Hawaiian islands, harvesting birds, turtles, seals, whales, fish, sharks, pearl oysters, and sea cucumbers. Commercial exploitation by Hawaii fishing vessels began as early as 1917. In the 1920s, the Hawaii-based Lanikai fished and pearled in the northwestern Hawaiian Islands. Anthropologist Marion Kelly's father, William Greg Anderson, was the captain of the Lanikai. Starting in 1928 at age nine, Marion spent summers at Pearl and Hermes Atoll where her family was part of the pearling venture. And these guys were good divers and they'd dive down and they'd spot the shells, big uh, shells huge things. They would bring the shells back and there'd be a man on the dock opening them up and then cutting the mussel away from the shell and then putting the mussel into a tray and then my mother would go through with her fingers feeling for pearls and then sorting them out. The shells themselves after they dried they'd chip the coral off of the outside of the shells and get them right down to the, the pearl shell itself and then pack them in gunny sacks to um, ship back to New York for pearl buttons. After World War II, two fishing bases were established at French Frigate Shoals. Taking advantage of an abandoned military airstrip at the atoll, fishermen transported trapped fish and turtles to Honolulu markets. One of these innovative fishermen was Buzzy Agard. We didn't have all the technology we have today with saltwater ice makers and, you know, super freezers and uh, deep freeze and flash freeze and all that. We didn't have that. We didn't have much navigation equipment. You would have to navigate by the seat of your pants, dead reckoning. A lot of the fishermen wouldn't go out of sight of land because they couldn't use the instruments. They didn't know how they'd have to depend on the mountain, so that meant no more than 30 miles out at sea so you could see land to come home. Because once you're out there, the ocean is all one. Where am I? I learned how to do the uh, identification of certain stars, read the altitudes. You can read them with your hand, one arm's length, and when you look and you say, well, that's 20 degrees, you know you're in the latitude. And then you use uh, dead reckoning for your longitude. You figure it out, I'm going to the west at so many hours, well, I should be here south of Neor tomorrow at about 3 o'clock. And then you look, start looking. At about 2 o'clock, you start looking, where is the island? <laughs> Leo Ohai, who has been fishing commercially for 61 years, was one of the leading pioneers in the art of aerial fish spotting. In 1950, while owner and captain of the Sea Queen, he transported a small aircraft to French Frigate Shoals to support fishing for Big Eye Scad, known locally as Akule. In 1946, we started using an airplane 
to sport fish. We never took no lesson, we never had no instructors, you know, we just, we had a plane in a pasture. And then we just threw it up right off the pasture, it was so easy to fly, you know, nothing hard actually about flying then. You can distinguish the fish, but it's a different color, you know, you find it in a, a round ball, you know. And uh, if it's a big fish, if it's big akule, the color is different from the smaller fish, like if it's a hahalalu. Akule, when you see it, it's really red sometimes. You can't make a mistake. A lot of times you gotta be real careful because you know, you have a limu and you have rocks covered with limu, look like fish a lot of times, you know. Well, after flying for, for years and years, you could spot just about any type of fish. Today, the fishing stations in the northwestern Hawaiian Islands no longer exist, and new navigational and fishing technologies have supplanted old. We used to have a cooler and throw them in a cooler, a little bit of ice. Well, now we have everything refrigerated. We have all the, uh, the temperature of the brine is exactly what we want. We know exactly when to take and pull the fish out. It'll be the best quality when we unload it here. We put in a lot of work and care into the fish. A lot of things are changing. But the dangers, which have led to lost lives and lost vessels, remain the same, as does the allure of the islands. People come into this area, they think they're coming into an area that's sort of a tropical paradise and these great reefs that you can go park. It's some of the roughest ocean in the world. The main challenge out there is trying to stay alive or keep everybody, anybody from getting hurt. It's important that everybody knows the routine of somebody falling over, overboard, well, how to stop the engines and, you know, to turn alarms on. And, uh, turn the deck lights on, you know, and the safety is the first thing. I think you want to prepare about the time when you have the best weather uh, that you're experiencing, so you hope the weather will hold. Uh, you have to supply, that is get your ice, get your food, get your fuel, get your men together, all your gear in good shape, and uh, you depart. Everybody has to be in the right state of mind, positive. I won't take anybody with me if they're not 100% into it, you know, I'll leave them home. It's a lot easier when you're working your way home, whereas if I start, say, French Frigate, and I'm working my way away from home, after 10 days and you keep getting farther from home, guys start getting depressed, and it's a little harder to keep morale up on the boat if, if you're getting farther from home. So what I'll do is I'll run for five or six days straight up, and we'll start fishing and work a bank, and, and if it's productive, we'll stay there. If not, I move to the next bank, but all the moves, we're getting closer to home. So it's it's positive feeling that we're, we're getting close, getting, getting to home. And there's certain kinds of things that happen up here, you know, that don't, they don't happen other places. Like the first time you ever come to Midway, or you come to French Frigate in the, in the early morning, you know, you look over there and it, the whole, sky is green you know from that from that glow of that lagoon and you, you don't know what the hell it is you know the first time it happens you go what's going on it's just so beautiful and you don't forget it and you get the disease and you just keep you keep going as long as you can one of the challenges to the northwestern hawaiian islands fisheries has been control of access to the area in the 1960s and 70s, foreign vessels, in particular Japanese and Soviet fleets, were common in the region, targeting tuna, billfish, precious coral, and groundfish, and greatly impacting these resources. In 1976, the U.S. Congress adopted the Magnuson Fishery Conservation and Management Act to combat foreign incursions and overfishing of U.S. waters, including the northwestern Hawaiian Islands. Back in, in the 70s, um, the bulk of the major fishing resources of the United States were being taken by foreign countries. And um, the Magnuson Stevens Fisheries Conservation Act was primarily put in place to close off, you know, U.S. waters to foreign fishing and to create a mechanism whereby U.S. fishermen could begin to be the, the people that, that harvested their own resources. The Fishery Conservation and Management Act also established eight regional fishery management councils to assist NOAA in managing fisheries in the U.S. exclusive economic zone, which extends out to 200 miles from shore. The Western Pacific Fishery Management Council manages the fisheries in federal waters around Hawaii and other U.S. Pacific islands. 
In the 1980s, the Council established fishery management plans for bottom fish, crustaceans, precious coral, and pelagic fisheries. Precious coral quotas have been set for all known and potential areas where the species can grow. However, there has been no precious coral harvesting in the northwestern Hawaiian Islands since the foreign vessels were removed. In the 1990s, the Council established the Protected Species Zone, which prohibits longline fishing within 50 miles of these islands and atolls, which are home to endangered monk seals and protected turtles and birds. The northwestern Hawaiian Islands contain over three-quarter million acres of coral reef habitat, or 70% of all recorded coral reef habitat within the waters of the United States. Coral reef conservation and management is a national priority that the Western Pacific Regional Fishery Management Council has worked on since the early 1990s when it began developing a coral reef ecosystem fishery management plan. This plan aims to preserve the health of the reefs. A preferred alternative of the plan is to prohibit fishing in 14% of the coral reef habitat of the federal waters of the northwestern Hawaiian Islands. In developing the draft plan, the Council considered the historical uses and cultural significance of the resource to indigenous Pacific Islanders in the western Pacific region. Bobby Gomes comes from a fishing family and has been fishing commercially for 20 years. He runs one of seven limited entry vessels operating in the Ho'omalu Zone, the islands north of Necker Island. Ten other limited entry permits, including two reserved for native Hawaiians, are issued for bottom fish vessels fishing in the Mau Zone, the waters around Necker and Nihoa. These 17 permitted vessels in the two limited entry zones of the northwestern Hawaiian Islands produce more than 40% of commercial bottom fish landed in the state of Hawaii. Onaga and Opakapaka, the red and pink snappers, hold particular cultural importance for Hawaiian residents and are an essential item in the Hawaii regional cuisine featured in local restaurants. Bottom fishing is when you send a rig consists of whatever four hooks, ten hooks, whatever you want to put on it to the bottom and you put some chum in a polo bag and, and try to get the pakas and onagas to bite your rig. Uh, I got a depth sounder and GPS plotter where you can see your boat position. So when you find the fish you uh, mark your spot and try to set your boat up, maybe make a drift first. Try to set your boat up where your lines are going to go right through the pile of fish. If they bite good, then you're going to go back up and try to set your anchor so you can anchor over the fish and, you know, try to get a steady bite. You can get a better bite when you're anchored up. Lobster fishing is another limited entry fishery in the northwestern Hawaiian Islands, which engages about half a dozen vessels for several weeks per year. Harvest is restricted to approved gear, a specific time period, and a predetermined number of lobsters from water surrounding specified islands and atolls, among other regulations. You throw your trap in the water with bait in it, and in the morning you haul it back up and you look inside the trap, and you're either happy or you're sad. That's pretty much the way it is. It's not like a fish that you can go look for on a sonar or fathometer. It's a uh, fishery with hours. The reason it has hours is that lobster do not typically like to crawl in the daylight hours. They go hide. So you tend to want to have your gear in the water, baited in the daytime. So when night comes, they crawl in, and at daylight, then you start working your gear. So with that, you, you end up sleeping at night. We pull a trap every eight seconds, and it's rebaited and stacked and everything and we set 80 traps in about five minutes so it's real fast it's real hot it's dirty slimy work with baiting with a mackerel and everything there's eels jumping at you and everything like that but all in all you get to sleep so uh, i would consider it one of the better better fisheries the experience of fishing in the northwestern Hawaiian Islands creates a unique opportunity for learning about natural resources and their fragility. I think it's very important that we uh, conserve all this, what we have here, because it's something unique. Uh, it's the probably the only place in the world that, uh, that we can actually go out and do this and uh, have fresh fish. With the management we have now um, and the limited permits, I think it's going to be this way for 
uh, for, for indefinite the way we're managing it now because we're, we're taking extra steps to uh, prevent what's happened on the mainland not to happen here. As Hawaiians, we think of tomorrow a lot. So, you know, it's, fishing's a real sensitive thing for me because it's my livelihood. And uh, when people fish and, and throw rubbish in the ocean and, and not take care of the aina, that's what disturbs me. They realized way back when that you had to take care of the resource because that's all you had. You only had these islands and you only had that. If you did something that hurt that, then you only hurt your own food supply. So then they had the kapu system, seasonal, you know, declare this fish in this area, kapu, don't catch any. Even the deep water fish had a kapu. With proper management, the Northwestern Hawaiian Island fisheries will continue to play an important cultural and economic role for Hawaii. We should recognize the achievements of the few who have lived the legacy, facing great odds with determination, innovation, and spirit. It's a very complex business, and it's a, re it's a business that, that operates out there that very few people have any idea of, of what it does. Uh, you, if you stood outside of Tamashiro Market and asked every person who came out where that fish came from, they'd say in there. <laughs> but, but beyond that, there, there's not a, a lot of knowledge about this business. If you go strictly by numbers, um, this isn't an area that's producing a whole lot of revenue. But when you look at what comes out of here, um, you know, it, it's stuff that is very important to, to our culture. What you find is an industry that is just incredibly fueled by um, love and history and, and just people who, who have, that don't know why or don't even think about it, but when you make them think about it, are, are there for some kind of passion about, about the ocean.